Hi, welcome to ESI 412 Nanotechnology, Materials, Infrastructure, and Safety. I am Professor Ukjun Nam at the Pennsylvania State University, and I will teach this course. This is the first unit, uh, General Perspectives, and Professor Steve Fonesh at the Pennsylvania State University uh, will teach the first three lectures. This outline, or we are following this outline, and in the first lecture, we covered general safety awareness and wet chemistry safety. And in this lecture, we're going to deal with gas safety, biological safety, and nanomaterial safety. So lecture number two will cover gas safety, biological safety, and nanomaterial safety. Well, we're going to begin with gas safety and I'm going to talk about some general concerns. And generally speaking, the gases used in nanofabrication and synthesis are contained in very heavy gas cylinders under high pressure. So they're shipped around the country, shipped around the world for that matter, in these heavy steel cylinders. Uh, and the, the uh, dangerous part of it is that these gases, uh, which may inherently be uh, uh, not dangerous uh, are become dangerous e even the ones that are uh, not dangerous per se they become dangerous because they're under high pressure so you have to be very careful that uh, when you receive these steel cylinders or you are working with them that the valve in the cylinder is not damaged uh, if the valve is damaged and the gases begin to shoot out obviously you have yourself a rocket uh, the cylinders, as I've said, are very heavy uh, and they can just be just plain uh, dangerous because they're, they're heavy. So you have to be careful with the way you, you handle these steel cylinders. Uh, the cylinders uh, have these gases under high pressure, but the gases uh, can be dangerous not only because they're under a high pressure, but because they themselves can be dangerous materials. So we were talking about dangerous materials in our last lecture, uh, and uh, gases can be inherently dangerous themselves. The chemical can be dangerous. And so they have to be stored in special cabinets, the gas cabinets, and they, these cabinets have to be equipped with alarms uh, uh, when the gas cylinders are in there, uh, and they have to be cabinets that uh, evacuate uh, any gas uh, that might escape. And you, you can see here some of the common uh, types of uh, labeling that you'll see on, on these uh, cylinders. You'll see the, or the gas cabinet rather, you can see it tells you the type of gas that's stored. This particular cabinet you can see is storing uh, chlorine gas, Cl2, and hydrogen fluoride gas, HF. And both are labeled as poisonous gases. Uh, and which they obviously very are, and uh, also very corrosive. Uh, so you can see the labeling that's on the gas cabinet. You don't switch things, you don't put different things in different gas cabinets. Gas cabinets are dedicated, and you can see this gas cabinet must contain two cylinders, one containing the gas chlorine, and the other containing the gas uh, hydrogen fluoride. So you can see the, the gas cabinet here. Here is the actual cabinet uh, right here. And then you can see the monitoring equipment that is monitoring whether any gas is inadvertently escaping inside. And then you can see the exhaust system here in case any gas were to escape. By the way, outside here you can see some other cylinders. These are containing, uh, these contain gases that are not dangerous. Uh, and uh, these are outside. The gas cabinet is containing the gases that are dangerous. Again, here's another view showing the exhaust. Exhaust. The frontal view. This is special glass, explosion resistant glass. And you can see the monitoring that's going on to make sure the gases are not escaping. These gas cabinets are a very, very important, uh, very, very important part of safety. Uh, very, very important part of environmental protection uh, in nanofabrication. 
Here are some gas cylinders that are not dangerous, and you can see these are just stored uh, on a gas uh, on a gas cylinder bracket. Here's the bracket, and they're being stored uh, being stored carefully uh, because, as we mentioned, first of all, the gases uh, can be under very high pressure or are under very high pressure, uh, and uh, the other thing is, of course, they're heavy and can be just dangerous if they were to fall on someone. Now when you transport cylinders around, uh, they must be equipped with a valve cap. You can see the valve cap up here. So the valve is underneath that. Uh, and then you, you want to transport them around uh, generally in a, uh, what's used as a safety card. You transport the gases around to make sure that they're under control and don't pose a physical threat to anyone. And the valve cap is there to protect the valve from being damaged. Remember we said earlier that if the valve is damaged, the gas could escape and you got yourself a rocket. So some general concerns. Uh, we must have, for toxic gases, alarm systems. Uh, we saw those already. Uh, we saw the alarm system that must be present. Monitors if any of the gas escapes. Turns on an alarm immediately. Uh, in our first lecture, we looked at some uh, uh, ideas of alarms that have to be around a facility. Uh, so these alarms need to be present. And uh, oh, Deb, I have a problem. <clears throat> in the first lecture, I didn't, I did not mention alarm systems. And I was going to say I don't remember uh, that. Uh, okay, okay go back to the start of the general gas concerns. Okay. And as you're doing, if you want to, like, like if the alarm does, highlight the whole world, like, mm, emphasize okay. it to them. Okay. You know, they must be installed. I mean, as you're, you're doing it, you can highlight it just to emphasize it. Okay. And um, change it a bit. So we'll just do three seconds and start right back here. Okay. Okay, let's talk about some general gas concerns. First of all, we, we, we talked about toxic gases. And in the case of toxic gases, there must be an alarm system. And that alarm system has to be such that it warns people in the laboratory or the fabrication facility about uh, the escape of gas and um, also, just as importantly, warns people in the building that there could be a potential problem. Now, a few view graphs ago, we saw the monitoring system on a gas cabinet. And that monitoring system, as we said, looks for escaping gases but uh, that monitoring system is then tied into an alarm system uh, which is uh, activated if escaping gases are detected. So the alarm system is uh, tied in with the monitoring system that we saw and these alarms must be calibrated to sound when chemical fumes, small amounts of gas, even well below danger levels, uh, Whenever that's detected, even though it's well below the danger levels, uh, the alarms uh, are then sounded and uh, the people in the facility, in the building, are aware that there could be a potential problem. And it's obviously necessary when the alarm is sounded to exit the laboratory immediately. Here are some pictures of alarms. Here is an uh, audio alarm and here is the light part. So you have both. You have the audio part to get people's attention, if there are, and, and you have the visual part to get people's attention. So if someone is hearing impaired, you still have the visual part to convey the idea that there could be a potential problem with a dangerous gas escaping. Now pyrophoric materials, we mentioned in our first lecture, uh, these are materials that uh, uh, or would, would be listed on an MSDS sheets, uh, and these are materials that can ignite spontaneously in air. And um, so, in other words, they can just start a fire immediately when unexposed to air. And some common pyrophoric materials that one encounters in nanofabrication are listed here. These happen to be uh, used very commonly in silicon processing. Uh, for example, in silicon nanowires, in silicon thin film transistors, in silicon displays, in microelectronics. So silane is pyrophoric. It will burn in air 
and turn into sand, but it can do so very dangerously and very quickly. Disilane, another obviously silicon-bearing compound, uh, also is pyrophoric, as are phosphine and diborane. So these are examples of pyrophoric materials. They have to be monitored. If they start escaping, they can start, or they, they will react spontaneously uh, and can start fires. Let's look more closely at silane, which is one of these pyrophoric gases that is commonly used in nanofabrication. It's a colorless gas and a very common source of silicon. Silicon used in silicon nanowires, silicon used in silicon photovoltaics, silicon used in thin film transistors, silicon used in microelectronics. So a very commonly used gas. It uh, readily decomposes even in atmospheric pressure uh, and uh, it undergoes a very energetic redox reaction. Redox means some things get reduced, that is they get electrons back, and some things get oxidized, that is they get, they get uh, electrons taken away. So it's a redox reaction, very energetic, and it forms silica, that is sand, SiO2, and water. And you see here the uh, reactions that take place. The silane molecule, SiH4, which is the silicon analog of, of methane, which is CH4. Uh, you see the silane gas reacts with oxygen, and it produces silicon dioxide, uh, and uh, hydrogen. So the, the hydrogen uh, of the silane molecule uh, it becomes hydrogen gas, uh, and the uh, silicon of the silane molecule becomes SiO2. That hydrogen gas further reacts uh, with the oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, producing water, uh, as you see on the right-hand equation. So the net result of this reaction of silane with oxygen in the atmosphere is the uh, silica particles, that is very fine sand uh, and water. Phosphine uh, also uh, is pyrophoric and is very, very toxic. Uh, so it bears, uh, demands a special attention it's also a colorless gas, but it uh, has the odor of rotting fish, and it's commonly used in silicon processing where doping is necessary. Doping is where you add impurities to change the electrical properties. So, for example, if you do uh, doping with ion implantation, uh, phosphine is commonly used to produce the phosphorus ions used in ion implantation to dope with phosphorus. Uh, as we said, it's pyrophoric, like silane, but it's, uh, as we also said, extremely dangerous. And if inhalation occurs, you can have coughing, nausea, burning sensation, diarrhea, abdominal pain, headache, dizziness, ataxia, which is nervous system damage, pain and tightness in the chest, tremors, shortness of breath, vomiting, and convulsions. Truly, the uh, impressive list of dangerous symptoms. So this is an extremely dangerous material that one has to be very, very careful of. Asphyxiates uh, are chemicals that are generally not dangerous, but they displace oxygen and therefore can cause suffocation. So even our good friend nitrogen, which makes up so much of the atmosphere, is an asphyxiate. Uh, so we have to be careful that we don't release too much of any asphyxiate uh, because, as we said, it can displace and dilute oxygen to the point where humans can't survive because there isn't enough oxygen. So if you inhale enough of any asphyxiate, including, our, as we said, our good friend nitrogen, which is, what, 70% of the atmosphere, uh, if you inhale enough of it, it can cause death. So you have to watch out for even the inert gases such as nitrogen. Now, more discussion of concerns, uh, it, it, we have to realize that not only the gases that we start 
are processing with. You know, not only our basic materials, not only our basic building blocks, uh, but even the gases that are byproducts can be dangerous and can uh, be released into the environment. And we can't let that happen. So we have to realize their danger problems and we can't allow them to just be released into the environment. So a common solution to dealing with gaseous byproducts is called scrubbing. In other words, scrub it out of the effluent. Effluent is the gases that are flowing away. Uh, scrub them out and clean up and get rid of this byproduct. So we'll take a quick look at some ga uh, clean gas uh, approaches, some ways to get clean, clean gas even though initially the gas may have some dangerous byproduct. So we're talking about safety here because we don't want these gases to be uncontrolled and we're also talking about environmental impact because we don't want them to be released into the atmosphere. So wet scrubbers are one way to capture these gases and don't allow them to get into the atmosphere. And uh, scrubbers have the advantage that uh, you, you literally uh, trap the bad gases in some liquid and that can be recycled or reused. Uh, that liquid can be recycled or reused. Uh, on the other hand, you may not be able to reuse or recycle the liquid, so then you have disposal issues and you have issues of getting rid of the, that liquid. And so there, there are many kinds of smart, uh, scrubbers on the market today. Uh, thankfully, people are really concerned about the environment. Uh, and so there's lots of ways of attacking this problem of not letting byproduct gases get into the environment. So here's a schematic of a basic scrubber. You see that the gas comes in, it's dirty, it's contaminated. It's coming from some reaction that took place. Uh, and we have special pumps to keep it flowing. And this is what we're calling the effluent, this stuff flowing out. We're calling that the effluent. And so it's flowing out, and with the pump we keep it flowing here. And it comes into the scrubber, perhaps it goes into several scrubbers, and then finally goes out to the atmosphere uh, over here. And in these scrubbers, we trap this byproduct into some generally liquid that we can then dispose of, or perhaps recycle. So here's a scrubber We're using a, a liquid, it's a spray tower. So it uh, sp actually sprays uh, liquid into the uh, gas that uh, has the byproduct. Uh, that is, this is our dirty gas coming in here. Uh, and uh, it sprays the liquid into the gas, removes the uh, gas. It uh, can also be used to remove organic, inorganic uh, particulate material as, as well as gases. And then there's a slurry down here that's captured, and then uh, hopefully that slurry can be recycled. If not, it can be disposed of in a controlled way. Uh, how do they work? Well, as we say, they, they mix the solvent, the liquid, with the gas that's being purified. The gas flows up into the, the wires, the mesh that makes up the scrubber. Uh, the wires condense the vapor onto the liquid. Uh, in other words, the wires are just places for the, the, the vapor and the liquids to react, and the liquid to react. The liquid then uh, drips down to the bottom. You get a slurry at the bottom, and then, as we said, you either process that slurry or, and recycle it, or you dispose of it some, in some way, in some controlled, approved way. So scrubbers uh, have uh, advantages. They are relatively low pressure uh, uh, facilities that you can handle flammable and explosive dust, so there can be dust in, them, in with the gaseous byproducts. Uh, so the gaseous byproducts can not only be contain gases that we don't want really to have, but can also perhaps contain dust. So you can see scrubbers can be great for getting rid of dust too, nanoparticles. Uh, they can be uh, uh, operated in highly corrosive atmospheres. They have a relatively low purchase cost, uh, usually pretty easy to operate, and uh, they also uh, <coughs> generally take up small uh, uh, spaces. And as we said, they can cont contain particulate matter, PM here as we call it, 
uh, as well as gases. Some disadvantages uh, may uh, have th th these disposal issues we mentioned, the slurry at the bottom, the mixture of the liquid and whatever it caught, be it uh, gas or particles. Uh, we, the efficiency, the mass transfer, in other words, how much it captures uh, per, per time unit is, is not that high or often cannot be that high. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore, it, it may not be that efficient. And it, in particular, it may not be that efficient at removing nanoparticles. Uh, it can be sensitive to temperature and it can have relatively high operating costs. So the technology is there and this particular technology has pros and cons. Uh, there's other types of uh, scrubbers. Uh, there's the, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> yeah, maybe we let me start off with other yep. types of scrubbers. <coughs> I just couldn't stop that cough. I know it's that's this allergy crap. <coughs> water here. Need more water? No, I got myself a good supply this time, so I'm still doing okay. Okay, when you're ready. There are other types of scrubbers. Uh, for example, there's a condensation scrubber. And this uh, is particularly effective against nanoparticles. Uh, it works by making the particulate matter larger. And so it's very effective for very fine particle materials. We don't want very fine particles. That is, we don't want nanoparticles escaping into the atmosphere. We don't want gaseous byproducts escaping. And so these scrubbers can also be particularly the condensation scrubber, effective against the nanoparticles. And so some advantages, it can handle flammable uh, and uh, explosive dusts, that is nanoparticles. Uh, it can handle uh, those materials uh, effectively, and uh, it can c c collect both gases and, and uh, nanoparticles, as we said. Some disadvantages, the effluent, uh, the, that is the stuff you collect that's got the nanoparticles and if uh, and may also have gaseous byproducts that you don't want. Uh, you then have a, an issue of what to do with that. Uh, and it's, it's a liquid. You have to worry about corrosive uh, problems with that liquid. Obviously, you, if, it, if you're using water, you have to worry about freezing. If you have the unit outside, they have it on the roof of your laboratory or your fabrication facility. Uh, and uh, you have to uh, worry about if you're using water, uh, you don't want a visible plume of water to come out because that can worry people. So you, you may have to reheat the liquid to avoid, the or the uh, water that might come out to avoid the plume. Remember, there are no bad liquids getting out, that's all been caught, but you can still have some regular water coming out, and you don't want to have a visible plume. As I said, that could worry people. Uh, the collected particulates um, may be something that's dangerous, you have to worry about that, and uh, it may be not recyclable, may not be recyclable, uh, and uh, in general, disposal of waste sludge can be very expensive. Okay, we've talked about gas safety, let's move on to biological safety. Biological safety is important in nanotechnology because there is more and more of a mixture of, of uh, nanotechnology with biological systems. Uh, people use DNA in nanotechnology, people use viruses in nanotechnology. On the other hand, people use nanotechnology in medicine. So biological safety becomes very important in many aspects of nanofabrication, nanotechnology. Uh, so you have to make sure you're ensuring that, that you have to ensure that you're using safe and proper use of biohazardous materials if indeed you are involved in this aspect of nanofabrication. So you must be properly trained on the materials and the work practices uh, to be able to work in this area, which is a very important area, which is defined by the overlap, as I said of nanotechnology and medicine and biology. Well, there are different biosafety levels. Again, this uh, terminology has been created by the government, uh, and so, so things can be standardized so everybody knows what everybody else is talking about. 
So the government has con created what it calls biosafety levels, which are usually called BSL uh, levels uh, or BSL ratings. And these are developed by the government to protect uh, personnel and, and to protect the environment. And uh, these uh, safety classifications, these BSL classification must be used uh, when biological materials and reagents are used. So again, if you're involved in nanotechnology that interfaces with medicine and biology, you want to be aware of these biosafety level, this biosafety level terminology. Biosafety level one, that is the uh, level that is appropriate for working with agents, that is biological agents, that do not cause disease. And uh, by biosafety level two is a level that's appropriate for working with agents that pose a moderate risk to person, personnel, or the environment. And biosafety level three is appropriate for working with infectious agents, which can cause serious disease or death. So for example, biosafety level two might be some strain of cells that poses some moderate risk, but is can be pretty well controlled. Biosafety level three can be some virus that is uh, quite dangerous uh, and uh, has to be very carefully controlled. So OSHA uh, has the current safety information on these levels and you can access OSHA or through the internet to find out the specifics of these different biosafety level designations and there any changes that might occur in this terminology. Moving here to nanomaterial safety now, we uh, will talk specifically about the problems that occur when you make nanoparticles. So nanotechnology is an emerging field, obviously, we, we know that, very important emerging field, and there's many uncertainties as to whether the unique properties of engineered nanomaterials, uh, such as nanoparticles, particularly nanoparticles, whether these pose any occupational health risks. And the Food and Drug Administration has yet to distinguish nanomaterials such as nanoparticles as being separate and different substances from their bulk source. In other words, there's a lot of discussion going on about whether nanoparticles are basically different than larger versions of the same material. Well, we know they're different, but are they basically different from a health point of view? That's the issue being discussed. And it's very uh, important to realize this is being discussed. Many other technologies have developed, and these kinds of discussions have never gone on. Uh, but in the, in the nanotechnology field, there are intense discussions going on about the implications of nanoparticles on health and the environment. And it's well known from a physics and chemistry point of view that nanomaterials can have different properties in the bulk materials. We talked about the MSDS sheets in our first lecture. Uh, the problem is they're generally written for bulk materials. They're not written for nanomaterials. So one has to realize that the physics and chemistry properties of nanomaterials can be different. Does this mean that their safety issues and their environmental issues can be different? This is the question that is in the forefront of discussions now among government agencies, research labs around the world. So at this time, a, a clear and concise set of rules for nanomaterial safety are under development. They're not developed. They're under developed by government agencies. And these are government agencies around the world. Uh, the U.S. government is very active in this, and, and uh, a number of uh, government uh, entities are involved. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institute for Occup Occupational Safety and Health. These uh, institutions, are, these government entities are all involved, and uh, they have published guidelines and procedures for nanomaterials. Uh, but as I said, there's no set of clear rules. Uh, and you might want to go to the NIOSH, which is the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. You might want to go to their website uh, and look at some of the discussions and, 
and uh, documents that you'll find there on nanomaterial safety. Uh, there's also a lot of work, as I mentioned, going on around the world, uh, in particular in Europe. You might want to go to the European uh, website, which is listed uh, here, and this information, and uh, see what the Europeans are doing. They're, in the same, they're at the same point that we are here in the U.S., looking at uh, uh, develop, the developing of, of uh, uh, procedures for uh, nanoparticle use in labs and in fabrication facilities. These same discussions are underway in Asia. It's a concern to everyone around the world. Nanoparticles we know are different in their chemical and physical properties. What does that mean in terms of their biology, medical, and environmental impact? So, workplace practice? Well, as we said, the materials are new. Regulations concerning them have yet to be completed. Uh, <clears throat> please remember that humans have been exposed to nanoparticles for a long time. They are in smoke from a fire. They are in the gases that come out of diesel engines. They are produced by nature and things like volcanoes. So humans have been exposed to nanomaterials for a long time. The question is, what is the best workplace practice for dealing with human-made nanoparticles? So as we said, controls and policies are under development. And uh, this is something that we have to monitor all the time as this uh, evolves. There's many unknowns about short and long-term exposures, and the limits have to be examined and developed. So until further information is available, interim safe working practice should be based on the, be the best available information. We gave you here uh, uh, some different sites, and uh, we listed some different U.S. government uh, agencies that are involved, and one must uh, stay uh, abreast of this topic and see how it develops and what evolves as the best working process, uh, work, uh, best working procedures. The, uh, the EPA in the U.S. is the leading the scientific efforts to understand the potential risks to humans, wildlife, and ecosystems from exposure to nanomaterials. Uh, but uh, as we said, this is these are studies. And study, the scientists are studying the unique properties of these materials, what can there be their potential impact to health and to the environment, and uh, how do we evaluate these impacts. And they're exploring how nanomaterials can be used also in a very positive way to help clean up the environment. There already have been techniques developed using nanoparticles for oil spills, for example. And of course, we're concerned about nanoparticles in this discussion, in their impact on health, but yet nanoparticles are having tremendous positive uh, effects in medicine. Already there are drug delivery products that use nanoparticles. So the excitement is there, and fantastic things happening with the use of nanoparticles, uh, even in cleaning up the environment, definitely in medicine, but we also have to worry about uh, how do we handle them properly in a working environment. And the uh, EPA right now is focusing on identifying sources of nanomaterials and how they're transported through the environment. In other words, if they get out, if some of them get out of a, uh, a product, in other words, a product is disposed of, somehow they get into the environment for the product, what happens? So it's being, the, that the life cycle of nanoparticles is being explored. As we said, the uh, impact on human health and ecological effects are being looked at uh, and uh, risk assessments are being undertaken. Uh, how do you do these risk assessments? Even that basic machinery has to be developed and is being developed uh, so that we have an idea of, okay, how do we assess the, the risk in the first place? Uh, and uh, we want to prevent risks of nanoparticles in the environment. How do we control them in the first place so they don't get loose? How do we look at this whole idea of, of, of the lifetime cycle? And uh, if the, something were to get loose, how do we mitigate against any risks that might occur in the environment? So this is the f 
first the technology that humans have come up with, which from the very beginning we're worried about what its downside might be. You know, we came up with fire, and we've been living with fire for a long time, and I think something like 30,000 people die of fires every year, uh, and uh, it's only recently that we started really worrying about how to control fires and stop them and prevent them. Well, here's a technology, a lot newer than fire, and we're starting at the very beginning at looking at how do we control this and make sure that we understand all its ramifications. So here is a look at the Environmental Protection Agency and all the things that particular agency is involved in. Looking at life cycle stages, remember we talked about people disposing of products and the product may have nanoparticles in, in it. What happens to those nanoparticles? What are the pathways in the environment? Uh, what's the transportation and transformation that may take place? Uh, what about human and uh, uh, the, the whole biosphere uh, impact? Uh, what happens to exposures to humans? Exposures to the whole bio uh, environment? And what are the effects? What are the, what's the risk assessment? How do you do risk assessment correctly? And then how do you do risk management once you understand the problem and you have developed correct risk assessment protocols. In other words, you have to make sure you're doing this right uh, and you have to make sure that you are uh, using it, using the information correctly. So nanomaterials have the greatest potential to enter the body through the respiratory system. So we all know that from smoke. I think we're very aware of that. Uh, smoke, diesel fumes. Uh, so those are, that's not from nanotechnology, that's just nanoparticles that are around all the time. They can also come into the skin or be ingested. Uh, the exposures can be short or long term. They can uh, have different effects based on results from human and animal studies. Airborne nanoparticles can be inhaled and deposited in the respiratory tract. And based on animal studies, nanoparticles can enter the bloodstream and translocate to other organs from the respiratory tract. So ultrafine particles can cause respiratory disease, even some types of cancers. Uh, we know that already from the fact that we've lived with nanoparticles since we had fires. Well, I guess actually since the first volcanoes. So we know about nanoparticles. We've put up with them for a while. But now we're trying to really understand them and learn more and just exactly what nanoparticles cause respiratory diseases and what type cause cancer. They can cause heart disease, but what type? They can cause central nervous system problems, but what type? And so we have to look at this. And we have to remember that these nanoparticles are so small, they're incredibly small. Uh, they're so small that they can stay suspended in the air uh, for a long time and behave as a gas. In fact, nanoparticles will stay suspended in the air forever unless they bang into something they chemically react with or physically react with, forming a bigger particle. And if they form even bigger and bigger and bigger particles, finally gravity will win and they'll fall down. Uh, in fact, we just talked about one of those scrubbers a few minutes ago that worked by collecting nanoparticles, agglomerating them, and then the, you get the bigger particle and it falls down into the slurry. So in the atmosphere, they'll, they will float around forever unless they encounter something that causes them to agglomerate into a bigger particle, then finally gravity will win doesn't win in the beginning because they're so small, but if they agglomerate, gravity will win and they will fall down. But uh, during that time when they're so small and floating, we have to be aware of the possibilities of what they can do with the lungs, the skin, and the eyes, and in general the whole human system. Um, so the following workplace tasks can increase the risk of exposure to nanoparticles. You can work with nanomaterials in liquid media without adequate protection. So, for example, that's why we kept saying you've got to wear gloves and you've got to be very, very careful that nothing gets on your skin. We talked about that in the first lecture and tried to make it very clear that things like gloves are very important. Uh, nanoparticles can be produced when you're pouring liquids or when you're mixing. In other words, you can form a tiny little nanoparticle that floats off into the air when you're pouring and mixing. And that can be very, potentially very dangerous. 
I think we've all, we all know this can happen. If you turn on the kitchen sink faucet fast enough, you can feel tiny little particles of water coming off. So this can happen when you're working with nanomaterials. So another problem then can be mixing and pouring operations. You have to be careful. Again, we talked about hoods earlier, uh, chemical hoods. We'll talk more about that. But you have to be very, very careful about controlling the environment and making sure these particles don't get loose. So you don't want to produce nanoparticles in non-enclosed systems. You do definitely do not want to do this. So I ask you to please always remember that there's the possibility that nanoparticles, nanoparticles can escape from what you're doing and that they'll float around forever unless they agglomerate. And uh, there's the potential that they can be inhaled, that they can get on people's skin, that they can get in the eyes. So you must always control the nanoparticles. You must always work with them in an enclosed system. And, of course, if you're dealing with powders, uh, then you have to be very, very careful with the weighing of the powder, the blending of the powder, perhaps spraying of the powder. powder. There are many in industrial processes where fine powders are used, a powder coating, and uh, people need to be aware of the possibility of those processes producing nanoparticles, uh, and those nanoparticles being loose in the environment, and then a potential risk to the environment and to human health. So the continuing this idea of workplace tests that can be problematic uh, you have to worry about equipment maintenance and processes used to produce or fabricate nanomaterials and the cleanup of spills and waste material containing nanomaterials. In other words, if you're using certain pieces of equipment to make nanomaterials, um, there's always the possibility that when you clean the material, that, that, that equipment up, that you can produce, be producing nanoparticles which can get into the environment. So once again, we stress but you need to be aware of that, and you need to work in controlled environments where these particles cannot freely uh, move around and where they're, where they're controlled, collected, and subject to a scrubber or some other way of getting the materials out of the uh, environment. So you really have to look at uh, process, you know, maintenance equipment processes or the, or the general fabrication processes and you have to worry about cleaning up a spill. You can't clean up a spill with some cloth, perhaps picking up nanoparticles, and then not properly disposing of that cloth, because you have yourself a source of nanoparticles. You have to be very careful with the cleanup procedure. And in lecture one, we talked about uh, kits for dealing with spills. And these are kits that are well thought out, kits that address the issue of, okay, I picked up the chemical or the nanoparticles, how do I now make sure they don't get loose again in some subsequent situation? Uh, so there's lots of ways of cleaning up dust that can capture nanoparticles. You have to be aware of that and you have to use such approaches. And you have to uh, obviously watch out for debris from machining, sanding, drilling, or any mechanical disruption. It's not just chemistry, it's not just pouring. It's simple things that we humans have been doing for a long time, machining, sanding, drilling, that can produce nanoparticles that can be very, very dangerous. So precautionary measures, obviously, watch out for aerosols. What are aerosols? Aerosols are not, and tiny little particles floating around in the air. Uh, so you have to make sure that you can control those. Uh, you have to worry about risk management. Uh, you have to look at places where exposure to nanomaterials can take place, and you have to minimize that potential exposure. You have to have uh, an evaluation of the hazard proposed. You have to look at uh, the, the, the chemical and physical data that are available, the toxicology data that's available. You have to do an educated risk assessment. And workers have to be trained in the understanding of this of these issues. They have to understand nanoparticles are special, they're very, very fine. They have to understand that we've been exposed to them since fire and volcanoes, but we have all kinds of new ones now. And now we can, you know, before we couldn't see them. 
Now we know they're there, we can see them, we have to worry about what they can do. We have to make sure that in nanomanufacturing, we're not creating a situation where these nanoparticles can be very, very dangerous. So we have to develop good work practices and the workforce has to be educated and very proactive in developing these good workplace practices. Precautionary measures continue, so you need criteria, criteria and procedures for controls. We've talked about ventilation being so important. We've talked about maintenance being an issue. Uh, we've talked about in lecture one, we really stress the protective equipment, the clothing, the gloves, or respirators. Uh, we didn't mention respirators in, in uh, lecture one, but those are special support systems for breathing that need to be used in situations where nanoparticles may have gotten loose. Uh, and so that would be in situations where you're addressing some problems that may have developed. And uh, there's really no guidelines available uh, on the clothing or apparel. We gave you our thoughts in lecture number one, but uh, there's no, there are no real guidelines available. But once you're educated, as you are now, having listened to these issues, you just have to prevent exposure and you have to do good risk assessment. Uh, and uh, we've given you some guidelines as to the kinds of clothing to wear and how to undertake risk assessment. So you have to systematically evaluate exposures uh, to ensure that control measures are working properly and that workers are being provided with the appropriate personal protective equipment. And uh, clean up and disposal. I'm going to mention it again. I've said it a couple times already, but uh, cleanup is very, very important. There's no guidelines available for that yet. Uh, how do you control spills or contamination? Again, nanotechnology is an industry, is a, is a human endeavor that's working with these issues right from the beginning. We're not going to wait, wait until there's some disaster to come up with uh, guidelines. We're working now in the beginning of this booming technology, blossoming technology. To develop guidance, and it's 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 on everybody's mind, and we're working on it. Um, we're looking at uh, we're looking at things done in the pharmaceutical industry. There's quite an overlap between nanotechnology and pharmaceuticals uh, in in the in the area of drug delivery, uh, and that's becoming a stronger overlap. So some of the things developed there might be applicable to uh, engineered nanomaterials, uh, and. Uh, there are obviously standard techniques already for cleaning up powder spills, including HEPA filtered vacuum cleaners. A vacuum cleaner can be a disaster if you don't realize that it can be really spreading nanoparticles around. So there are, there are special vacuum cleaners out there that are available, special cloths for picking up powders and nanoparticles. These things have to be understood. You have to be aware of them, a good lab or a fabrication facility absolutely has to have these sorts of capabilities. Liquid spills, uh, you obviously want to try to absorb what's been spilled. Uh, we talked about how bad it can be if claws with nanoparticles on them uh, are reused and not carefully disposed of. And energetic cleaning methods such as dry sweeping or using compressed air can absolutely be disastrous. They can just wind up spreading the nanoparticles more effectively everywhere in a very uncontrolled way. Um, animal studies have shown that nanoparticles can be dangerous. Uh, they can affect, for example, in rats and mice, pulmonary function, tissue damage. It can cause lung tumors. Here is a reference to just some work out there. In fact, there's a whole journal now on nano, called nanotoxicology, just looking at the toxicological issues of, nano, uh, of the nanoscale, posed by the nanoscale. So as we said, people are aware of this from the very beginning of this technology. You're in the beginning of this technology, and people from the very, its very beginning are worried about the toxicological issues, which I think is excellent. And these... Uh, Ideas are evolving and growing. You, as someone participating, has to be aware of this and indeed, hopefully, participating in the development of these sorts of standards and this sort of risk assessment and this sort of 
uh, ideas of how to handle these situations. So the studies have shown that have been done so far that poorly soluble low toxicity particles, uh, the uh, important thing is expressed as particle surface area. In other words, the larger the surface area per volume, the more of an issue the particle can be. Uh, in addition to particle size and surface area, as we know, surface area surface area to volume gets huge in the nanoscale. Uh, studies have shown that other particle characteristics can influence toxicity. Uh, reactive oxygen generation on the particle surface is, a, is one important factor. So look, when you think about nanoparticles, you, uh, remember they're so small, they have a huge surface to volume ratio. Their morphology is important. What are they shaped like? And their surface chemistry is very important because so much of the surface is, is active that's very, very active chemistry, uh, and that chemistry can be very, very uh, important and can be different than the chemistry of the bulk of the specimen. So you have to think about these things um, that uh, uh, are special with the nanoscale. The studies indicate that for nanoparticles with similar properties, the toxicity of a given mass dose will increase with decreasing particle size. Again, it's this old business, the surface area the nanoparticles have a huge surface area compared to volume. So again, I stress the different thing about nanoparticles is the huge surface to volume ratio. You have to worry about their shape, their morphology, and you have to worry about the chemistry that may be going on in their surface. All of these things can affect tox toxicity. <clears throat> so continuing with the uh, discussion of what's happened in the, seen in the animal studies, carbon nanotubes, CNT, they're nanoparticles. Uh, they're just uh, long nano, uh, you know, essentially, well, almost one-dimensional nanoparticles, as opposed to a sphere, uh, and they uh, they can have some problems. It's been shown that their that their toxicology can be different than nanomaterials with similar similar chemical composition, and single wall carbon nanotubes uh, are, have been shown to produce adverse effects, including granulomas of the lung in mice and rats, and, uh, and whereas ultrafine carbon black, which is, again, carbon, didn't produce the same thing. So this point stresses what I said about morphology. See, th these are long, sort of wire-like things. They're both made up of carbon, but this is carbon sort of spheres, and this is long wires of carbon. Both are just carbon but they have different effects. So that, remember I was mentioning morphology, something you have to keep in mind at the nanoscale. Morphology here doesn't seem to be a problem. Morphology here does seem to be an issue. Uh, while single uh, wall carbon nanotubes and carbon black are carbon based, they're just, they are just plain carbon. Uh, the single wall carbon nanotubes uh, have this unique fibrous structure, what I call the wire-like structure, and they have a unique surface chemistry uh, that unique chemistry and that fiber structure means they are fantastic electrical conductors and they have great strength. But it also could mean that their tox toxicology is different than that of, say, carbon black. Uh, and some recent studies uh, have said that uh, carbon nanotubes might actually behave similarly to asbestos in human lung tissue, which of course is a uh, reason for great concern. Okay, well, today we have covered uh, lecture uh, two of unit one. Unit one uh, deals with the safety, uh, uh, and uh, unit one in, has had lecture one. We've already done that, covering general safety and awareness. Uh, unit one had lecture one, the lecture one topic of wet chemistry safety. In today's lecture, lecture two, we discussed uh, chemical safety uh, I'm sorry, we discussed uh, gas safety, and we discussed biological safety, and we discussed nanomaterial safety. And uh, we talked about the fact that gases are used, uh, they're ubiquitous in processing in the lab and in the fabrication facility. We have to worry about the basic danger of the gas, is it toxic? And we, have to, we also have to worry about uh, the gas cylinders, they're just big, ugly, dangerous things in themselves, and then we have to worry about getting rid of uh, 
any byproduct gaseous materials. In the biological area, we said that's very important because there's quite an overlap and a growing one between nanotechnology and biology and medicine. And we talked about the biosafety level uh, terminology. And in nanomaterials, we focused down on nanoparticles. Again, these can be in the fluid coming off from a process. They can be uh, very, very dangerous. They can be benign. And uh, there's a lot of studies going on looking at nanoparticles, uh, trying to understand when they can be uh, 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 of a high toxicological, toxicological, toxicological risk and when they can uh, be of moderate risk or a situation where we can control the risk. Uh, in lecture three, we'll be talking about energy safety and environmental concerns. I hope to see you then.